The folks that are really staunch advocates of GOL style cutting, they have probably adapted it from a response to barber chairs. And it's true. It's a good style to, to remove the risk of a barber chair. GOL style really does a phenomenal job of eliminating the risk of barber chair because it's cutting out all of this wood. It's, it's, it's gutting and removing all of this wood in here. Now I've got a little faint blue line to shore the hinges, but generally you've just got these blocks. And you've even come in and done what's called nipping the sap or boxing the heart. So if this is the tree, if this is a pure straight hinge with live edge right here, on a white oak, just leaving that little bit of live edge can rip the can rip the log right here in the corners. So you maybe come in here with the saw and just just put a cut in there and a cut in here. So this is your face cut, you're trying to fall the tree this way. This is called boxing. Well, that's my coffee pot. This is called boxing the hinge. All right, now this is called gutting. When you come in with the saw, right in here, in between the hinge, you remove that center. So you're gonna leave two little rectangles. And, and honestly, they're gonna look like, they're gonna look like two by fours. So like two two by four tabs holding that tree up. And this has all been severed out with this one little other piece of wood that's keeping it in place. And that gets cut off as the trigger. You pull the trigger and the gun goes off. So you pull the trigger, the tree goes over. It works when you put it on the right tree. It works every time when you put it on the right tree. When you put it on the wrong one, once in a great while, it is absolutely lethal, okay? You're expecting the tree to go this way. In your mind, you're saying, I'm gonna nip that trigger and run away that way. And the people who sell this style, what do they sell it for? They say this style gives you the most time to get away from the tree. How far can you get away from a tree that's going the wrong way and chasing you down? Is it best for you to try to outrun a fly swatter? Because that's what this tree is if you're going the wrong way. If you're running the wrong way, you'd have been better sidestepping this stump and staying right here, okay? If this thing wanted to go down, you thought it was going to go that way, so you ran like this. And when you realize it's coming at you, you keep going. But you're just running into the limbs. You're running into the top. You're running into the tangle. So instead of having to dodge a 25-inch diameter uh, main stem, you now have to dodge a 25, 30, 50, 60-foot top and a hail of tree parts falling from the sky. Because you ran the wrong way. Your expectation was 100% confidence in going this way. You set it up to go this way. You said it's going to go. You snip, you run, you run the wrong way, you get crushed. Here's what that looks like. That's where that man is right now. He's right there crushed to death. The comments that I saw on this are absolutely despicable. I am ashamed of the type of things people think is acceptable to say about another human life, another human soul. It was a father, son, brother. That's just awful. You'd have been better to be watching that tree, knowing what it was doing, and sidestepping just a few feet. Just enough that if it's going to kick up off of some other stump or a rock or a, a hill, just enough that you could steer clear of that. You wouldn't have to run so far. That poor man's accident should demonstrate to all of us that two steps in the correct direction is better than 25 in the wrong direction. But you've got to know what the right direction is. The sooner you know for certain which direction it's going, the safer your life is. Learning at the last second is the worst possible outcome. It's my opinion that minimum feedback gives you maximum opportunity for surprise. Maximum feedback gives you minimum opportunity for surprise. Now, a GOL laid out on the wrong tree, a trigger wood style laid out on the wrong tree, has almost no feedback. So when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in a big way. The minimal amount of surprise comes from a tree 
that is sitting down as you cut. Sitting down as in pinching your bar. Now, no, you don't go and get yourself pinched unless you make a mistake, but the bar is like a barometer. It's, a, it's like a gauge. It's like a feeler gauge, okay? You put a feeler gauge to know, is it tight or is it loose? Your chainsaw bar is a standard size. You cut the kerf with that bar. If you can continually go into that kerf and it's the same, the tree hasn't moved. If you go to put it back in and it's tight or it, it won't even go in, you know that the kerf has closed. If it's wide open, you know that the kerf has opened and that is telling us what the tree is doing. So with a live cut, we can come in the back and we can set an indicator wedge. So we've cut out our face cut and now we start coming in from the back and we're cutting back here, okay? So we're cutting in back here and when we get in far enough, we put a wedge. The tree has not moved yet. We don't pound it in, we just set it in loosely, okay? We set that wedge in loosely and we keep cutting. Now there's still a massive amount of wood, the tree will not go over. We keep cutting and we're watching the wedge. If it drops, that means that the kerf is opening because the top is starting to go this way. If the kerf is opening, the tree is going this way. And the indicator wedge, gravity will cause it to fall out. You want to use your longest wedge for this and not set it deep. You want to set it just in the tip. If the kerf starts to close, now you've got a bite in there. So it sets, you know, you put it in by hand. And it sets down on the wedge, but your bar is not jammed in there. And if it is jammed, then you know, you've at least got to start. So you drive this wedge, you drive another, you drive another, and you get the tree lifted enough to get your bar free. So this gives you feedback, critical feedback that's required for safety to eliminate surprises. It comes at an expense. Now remember, life is a seesaw, okay? It's a seesaw. Safety is not free. Safety comes at the expense of, let's say, production. The safer you are, the slower your output. You can put all the guards and safety switches and shutoffs and computers you want on machinery. You can make it idiot-proof. Believe me, all you're going to do is find a better idiot. That idiot is going to manage to get themselves hurt by, sticking, by lifting up the guard and sticking their finger in the spindle anyway. Okay? Idiots don't need to be around machinery, and that's just all there is to it. They need to learn, usually by error, how not to be an idiot. They need to learn how not to be an idiot. So you cannot take all risk out of risky work. You cannot make offshore drilling, underwater welding, search and rescue missions, war, combat, marriage, aviation, firefighting, crime fighting, you cannot legislate safety. You can't. There are things that are inherently dangerous and logging is one of them. There is no textbook Ivy Tower office answer to save the logger's life. It is up to the logger. The logger's life is his and his alone to protect. And how he can protect his life is by having situational awareness and always avoiding surprises. It matters less which way the tree goes then it matters that the logger knew it was going there. You understand? So, the trade-off with this live steering method, and when I say live steering, I mean that we can alter the angle and cause the tree to, to go as we steer. The risk is, can we sever enough of that hold wood rapidly enough to not have the barber chair. And that's always a flip of a coin. The sharper your chain, the more powerful your power head. If you got some 395 ported hot saw, well, you're in pretty good shape, buddy. If you're out there with a farm boss and a 16 inch bar cutting 30 inch wood, I hope your insurance is paid. You understand? There's a trade off. The person that's got the wrong tool for the job, it's his own responsibility. It's your own responsibility to know whether you're an idiot or not. If you've got three extension ladders, one of them in the bucket of a tractor, and two of them lashed to a tree, you might win a Darwin Award. Will it be someone else's fault? 
Can they legislate you to be doing that safer? No, they can't. So what option do we have to reduce the risk of barber chair and still get feedback? My opinion, the only way to eliminate the chance of barber chair is to sever nearly all of the fiber before the top leans off its center. If this top is sitting up here and almost all of the fiber is severed, it cannot barber chair. All it can do is fall over. It might be able to fall any which way. And the people who hate this style that I'm going to describe, they hate it for lack of control. They say, you have no control. That's not directional felling. <sighs> I can't argue with that. They're not wrong. They're kind of right. My question, my argument, is how much control does a man need over a tree? If the tree is in a forest and he's been contracted to harvest that tree and there's no structure nearby, there's nothing of value, there's no life at stake in terms of people out in the woods, which if you're felling trees, there shouldn't be anybody anywhere in reach of that tree. How much control does a man need? If you are able to sever all of this wood, that tree can simply fall over. It cannot barber chair and it will be allowed to corkscrew. Now we think of that corkscrew as ultimately incredibly dangerous. However, a monster tree that is completely free of the stump is able to fall and hit really small trees and reflect off of them. It is able to roll in ways that you can't imagine. It's like ballet. It's this giant monster broccoli top and it can lay into a dog hair thicket of understory with a more delicate landing than you've ever seen if the whole bottom is severed, plumb off. Now, old timers around me call that match sawing. Uh, another, my mentor, a guy named John, great guy. John, if you're watching, God bless you. Thanks. Love you, buddy. Appreciate all your help. Um, he calls it slick stumping. Why? Because when you're done, the stump is slick. There's no pulled fiber. If you're cutting veneer, really high, high dollar wood, and you've got a ragged stump after, you know, if, you're, if your stump has got all this ragged junk, if, if there's a, just one strand a foot long, well, your buyer's gonna, gonna trim that off. He's gonna knock that back. You might go from a 12 to a nine, okay? So you can't be cutting high dollar wood and having ragged stumps. You can't be having cracked stumps this high or cracked butt logs. So how do we slick stump and when should we slick stump? Well, I hate to get y'all hot and bothered and then leave you in suspense with blue balls here, but 13 minutes is about as long a video as I can process on this phone. So I'm going to cut this one off here and get working right away on finishing out this segment. Please stay tuned because this is, I think, a pretty good, pretty good thing to learn here. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Praise the Lord.